This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 359 was produced on January 19th, 2023. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Lynn Alden returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll revisit her crude oil outlook and then dive into a slide deck exploring Lynn's most interesting insights and perspectives for 2023. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Listeners, be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after Eric's feature interview with Lynn, when Eric, Nick, and I will discuss the charts on that S&P 500, the NASDAQ, VIX, gold, and the oil markets. Eric, before we get on to that feature interview with Lynn, let's cover crude oil. EIA inventory is delayed by a day for the holiday, so it wasn't available when I recorded before the market open on Thursday morning. We did, however, on Wednesday afternoon get the API, that's the American Petroleum Institute uh, report, which is the private service that reports inventory data. They reported another big build on inventory, both nationally and in Cushing, Oklahoma. We'll have the EIA data in next week's podcast. As of Tuesday afternoon, I had been planning to say on this week's podcast, okay, we're coming up on the make or break point for crude oil to signal a new uptrend. And that make or break point was the 100-day moving average on the continuation chart of crude oil futures, WTI crude oil futures. Touched it almost exactly to the penny and then straight down from there. So it looks like so far at least the make or break was a break. However, it's a little bit early to say that it's necessarily going to continue to be a break. Oil sold off along with other risk assets as the stock market sold off. Getting down to almost touch its eight-day moving average, actually stopping right on the five-week moving average at 78 spot 53 overnight Wednesday into Thursday morning. We need to see a move over 82.50, that's the continuation 100-day moving average, and stay there in order to confirm a new uptrend. So far, this attempt failed, but hey, the year is still young, and it hasn't failed completely. It hasn't even gotten below the 8-day moving average, which says this is just a pullback. It's not necessarily a change in trend. Slow stochastics are high and wobbling, though, so it could be that we have another cycle lower before we eventually move higher. We'll see what happens. We have Lynn Alden on this week as the feature interview guest. She was the one to call $70 as the most likely bottom for crude oil last time we had her on several months ago. We got down to 70 spot 08 the other week, so we'll call $0.08 cents good enough for government work. We'll ask Lynn in this week's feature interview whether or not she thinks that that's going to be the final bottom and what the outlook is from here. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Lynn Alden. Eric, why do we get Lynn back on the show this week? Well, Patrick, Lynn is a listener favorite. It's been too long since we've had her on the show. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, I'm quite keen to get her crude oil update since she, so far at least, was very prescient in calling $70 as the likely bottom. And we came just within a few cents of that. So I'm really looking forward to her update. Eric's interview with Lynn is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, 
Contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Lynn Alden, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Lynn has prepared a slide deck to accompany today's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button above Lynn's picture that says, looking for the downloads. Lynn, it's great to get you back on the show. Last time we spoke, I think oil prices were around $90 or so. And you told our listeners, look, you were very, very bullish longer term, but you thought in the short term, prices could get all the way down to $70. Um, you totally missed that call. It was 70 spot 08. So you're eight cents off. Uh, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and score that one as a win. Um, how should we look at it now, though? Does that mean the bottom is in at 70 spot 08? Or could it be that uh, we've got another wave down? And are you still bullish long term? And when do you think this this market turns around? Sure. Good questions. And, and thanks for having me back. Um, I'm still long-term bullish on energy. The supply-demand situation is still long-term very tight, you know, especially on the supply side. And now, uh, you know, we, now we have China partially reopening to some degree. We'll see how fast or how slow that goes. But essentially, the long-term thesis, I think, is still quite bullish uh, for the whole space. In the near term, I think that at these, these lower price levels, uh, it's been de-risked to some extent in the intermediate term. At this point, you know, I'm not trying to call a specific, you know, exact bottom uh, on the market. Uh, there's still a lot of like a lack of clarity for the next uh, few months uh, in terms of, you know, decelerating economic activity. But I think that as you look out a couple of years, I think the situation is still quite bullish. So, you know, a lot of disclarity in the near term, but still very bullish long term. And I, I think a lot of oil equities are attractive. I think a lot of pipeline equities are attractive. And I think also uh, the underlying is pretty attractive. Let's move on to your slide deck. Listeners, again, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. Starting on page two, you've got the decoupling. Oh, so many things are decoupling in this crazy world. Which one are we talking about? So this is the unemployment situation and federal deficits in the United States. And, you know, this is partially a demographics observation, and it's also just, you know, the past history of, of, of debts and how we got to here. So uh, basically starting 2016 or so, you know, you started to see that even though unemployment was still getting better, the federal deficit actually began widening. And so historically, over, you know, throughout economic cycles, normally, you know, tax receipts and the overall uh, federal deficit are very correlated with the unemployment cycle. But what we saw then was that in large part due to a lot of retiring people of the baby boomer generation and, and increased payouts to them, we started to see a decoupling where, where you know, basically even though an unemployment was getting better, larger federal deficits. And and that blew out, obviously, in during the whole COVID stimulus pandemic lockdown era. Uh, that completely blew off the chart, uh, as you can see there. And now we're kind of ricocheting back from that. But when you look out longer term, this decoupling still exists. Basically, no matter how strong or weak the labor market is, uh, you still have structural deficits, uh, well over a trillion dollars a year, uh, five or six percent of GDP, potentially higher if you have weak asset prices or if you have you know, further rounds of stimulus or tax cuts. And on the, the right there, I have the Social Security Trust. And so basically for, for several decades, you had more money flowing into there and they hold a form of non-marketable treasuries uh, as savings. But now over the past couple of years, you're starting to roll over, which is basically that the trust is now taking in less money than it's paying out. Again, just mainly due to demographics. There's just, It's a more top-heavy aged population. And based on current projections by the Social Security Administration, this is uh, expected to draw down by the mid 2030s. And but we're already on like, you know, the rate of change is now rolling over. And as we know, in macro rate of change is everything. And so essentially, this is this is going to be a, a permanent addition to the federal deficit going forward. And the reason I bring these up is because fiscal spending is a significant part of the of trying to answer the riddle of whether you're going to have structural inflation or structural deflation. Uh, it doesn't really affect what's going to happen over a six or 12 month period. That's there's much more cyclical factors at play. Uh, but this is like an underlying background thing that we have to be aware of that really wasn't the case uh, in prior cycles. <laughs> 
Lynn, let's talk about the reflexive effects of the Social Security Trust drawdown, because it seems to me that since the 1960s, at least, the smartest people in society have all recognized that the Social Security Trust Fund was unsustainable. And as is always the case, the smartest people in society get ignored by the stupidest people in society until things really start to hit the fan. And once the you know, the oncoming asteroid that's going to take out society that the, the smartest uh, scientists knew about for decades, once it's in sight and you can see it coming, everybody freaks out and panics all at once. How long do we have before the masses wake up and say, wait a minute, you know, it, it's not Social Security is unsustainable someday. It's I'm not going to get my payments in the time frame that I expected to get them. I'm screwed. Now I'm really worried about this. So the official answer is the mid uh, 2030s, and that, that that depends on a lot of different factors that can uh, push it forward or pull it back by a couple years. The other answer is that it's already happened to some degree, not that it's near term, but that the effects are starting to impact markets in the sense that there's wider deficits even under the best of uh, economic conditions. The way that this works is, is it's actually pretty um, – weighted towards the end of it, right? So because that large pool of capital, you know, nearly $3 trillion is earning interest, it starts drawing down pretty slowly because, you know, they're, they're eating out of their interest and then they're also eating into principal. Once they get towards the end, like when they get to the late 2020s, when they get into the early 2030s, that drawdown starts to accelerate because they're no longer earning interest uh, by, you know, they have a much smaller base with, with which is paying interest, and yet they're still drawing down very quickly. So more and more of that gets eaten out of principle. And so it's one of those things where for the next few years, this is going to look like a tiny drawdown. It's going to be rolling over slowly like we see, uh, you know, just beginning to on that chart. And, and then later it's going to accelerate. So I would say by the time you get into the, you know, the, the early 2030s, uh, it's going to be pretty obvious, you know, kind of like how people talk about uh, debt ceiling issues and stuff like that, you know, six months in advance. Uh, I think the Social Security Trust is going to become a bigger issue then. But, you know, even between now and then, this is going to be a, a impact uh, on the deficit and kind of a background mild inflationary force. Moving on to page three, a lot of people, including myself, are getting pretty excited about gold, which has really started to take off. Now, most people think about the price of gold in terms of real interest rates. You've got a different relationship here. Tell us about it. So I think I think real interest rates are a key variable to gold. Uh, it's not the only variable. And this is this is less so to show correlation and just kind of um, to make a point. Basically, from you know 1980 until the present we had higher and higher debt as a percentage of GDP. But you also had lower and lower structural interest rates. And so during like the 1980s, uh, especially the late 1980s, you had a lot of kind of peak concern around the debt. Basically, you had just huge interest payments because you had the combination of rising debt and you had very high average interest rates. But uh, a lot of those people were early, right? They they were concerned early, and it took decades to to materialize. And so basically, even though you greatly increased the debt to GDP ratio, you offset it by lower and lower interest rates, and so the interest cost was manageable, and that helped reduce the, the you know the possibility of a fiscal spiral. As this is starting to break out. My contention is that, you know, basically as interest rates hit zero, as they start, you know, maybe chopping around going sideways now, while debt as a percentage of GDP is still increasing, as we go forward again, you know, through this decade, we're going to start to get, uh, you know, more and more meaningful interest expense, which starts causing a fiscal spiral because, you know, you need, you need more and more treasury issuance just to pay off uh, that much bigger interest burden. And in a very gridlocked political environment, it's really hard to make, you know, kind of a grand bargain type of combination uh, tax increase and, and spending cuts to kind of balance things. And so this is likely set to continue. And then when you add things like, you know, the confiscation of, you know, freezing of reserves uh, and just kind of overall uh, geopolitical shifts, I think it's pretty clear that for many nations, gold is going to be favored over treasuries, not in terms of the sense that, you know, nations are going to dump their treasuries and buy gold, but that the marginal buying pressure uh, will continue to shift towards more commodities, more gold, more loans to secure commodities, things like that, and away from, you know, large amounts of treasury security holdings.
You brought up interest rates and the concerns a lot of us have had about the long-term trend as, as interest rates were collapsing all the way down to almost zero. A lot of people said, wait a minute, this is causing governments to spend beyond their means to the point that when interest rates recover, we're not going to be able to service the debt and it's going to cause a uh, sovereign debt crisis. What do the slides on page four tell us about that? It tells us that it's both a concern, but only on the appropriate time frames, right? So if you look at the chart on the left, that, that shows just the raw amount of U.S. annual interest expense. And you can see that it was sharply rising through the 70s and, and the 80s. And especially in the late 80s, that's when that's when people freaked out about the debt. I mean, that's when the, that's when the uh, famous debt clock was put up in New York. That's when you had politicians running as third-party candidates and, and, you know, some of the best performing third-party candidates in history to, um, you know, bring the public debt to public attention. And they ended up being obviously right in the long term. It's not mathematically sustainable, but they kind of in some ways called the top because if you look at that chart, once you got into the 90s and the 2000s, uh, U.S. interest expense actually flatlined uh, in nominal terms pretty much, and then it rapidly fell as a percentage of GDP. And that was for a variety of reasons. Essentially, that was peak U.S. demographics. That was like, you know, baby boomers were like peak in the workforce. Uh, our labor participation rate was like, you know, st at structurally multi-decade high levels that we've since rolled over from. Uh, that was, the, you know, you had all the dot-com money. Basically, that was just a very booming time. And so the combination of you know, uh, smaller deficits, falling interest rates uh, really helped keep a lid on that for the next couple of decades. And so all the people that talked about, you know, the debt being a problem were kind of pushed aside. It was like, yeah, yeah, we, we hear that before. Uh, what's interesting now is that as you've reached the zero bounds and as you've chopped along sideways for a while, and now that we're likely entering another just more structural inflationary period just due to the commodity capex cycle, uh, supply side constraints, higher interest rates, more money creation. You know, now that we're we're kind of um, the combination of higher debts and sideways to higher interest rates is starting to blow out that interest expense again, and so it's kind of like almost like re it's like we took like a two decade pause on all those concerns people had, uh, but now we've kind of you know we picked all that low hanging fruit and now that problem is continuing, and so the chart on the right that's the one that shows interest expense as a percentage of GDP and it showed how it's really it's over the past two decades it's really moderated. Uh, but the problem is that now that, that some of those forces are no longer there, those, those ever falling interest rates, this is set to begin expanding again and start to, to kind of recreate the problem that people had in the 70s and the 80s, except at a, at a much higher debt to GDP level. So, you know, this is one of those things where people thought it was a problem. The problem never materialized. People then, mis they got the wrong conclusion that it's never going to be a problem and instead that it's just it's a delayed problem. And so I think we're actually entering the period this decade, especially by the second half of this decade, where this starts to become more and more of a problem. And the way that interest rates work, obviously, is that a lot of debt is fixed rate. So that applies to the government, right? Their average duration is five or six years. Uh, of course, it, there's a big range there. They have all sorts of different maturities. Uh, corporate debt is also pretty long term. You know, the consumer sector has a, a, a very significant amount of 30-year mortgages. Uh, it's very, it's very fixed rate debt. And so, just because the Federal Reserve uh, increased interest rates and just because the bond market increased interest rates does not immediately cause a lot of pressure. The pressure instead happens quarter after quarter, year after year. The more of those interest rates they elevated and start. Uh, having some of that fixed rate debt mature and get refinanced at these higher rates. And so, for example, over the next you know, two, three, four years, as a lot of the government's short-term interest rates, and that's where a lot of it is front-loaded, as that increasingly gets refinanced at higher rates, uh, that starts blowing out the interest expense of the U.S. government, which again is is financed you know, by more and more debt. And so this is actually something that is beginning to become material. Uh, I would say that it contributed to the 2019 repo spike. It contributed to why there was so much stimulus done during the uh, you know 2020 and 2021 lockdowns and all that. And it's I, I think it's going to start impacting us again when we look out in, in the next few years. Let's move on to page five, Fed remittances. Boy, took a nosedive. Uh, what is that that's nosediving on the right side of the chart? 
Uh, so that's the Federal Reserve's payments to the U.S. Treasury. And the chart is somewhat misleading because they, they – in the middle of the chart, they recalculate how they're actually doing it. And so, for example, most of that chart shows the weekly money sent from the Fed to the Treasury. And it was always positive, right? So basically, the, the Federal Reserve, it has both assets and liabilities. And just like just like any other bank, it, its assets pay higher interest rate than its liabilities. And so it, it, it earns a profit. It pays its operating costs. It, it pays a dividend. Uh, to its to its owners, and then it has to remit the excess money after all that to the U.S. Treasury, uh, and that's you know that's average something like a hundred billion dollars a year, basically a couple billion dollars a week. However, because they raise interest rates so much and from such a low base, for the first time in in kind of modern history, they've reached a point where they're actually losing money. Uh, so their their liabilities, which consist of things like you know reserves uh, for banks uh, and reverse repos, that's paying a higher interest rate than their average bond book, uh, especially you know yield on cost, basically what they bought those bonds at. Uh, and so now they're no longer sending money to the treasury. Uh, instead, they're basically just just um, collecting a bunch of deferred assets. Where even if they become profitable again, they get to pay themselves before they would begin sending money to the treasury. And so. Over the past decade, uh, and real quick, why this chart is somewhat misleading is because once they turn negative, they start calculating it as cumulative losses, right? So even though it's nose diving, that's representing now a cumulative figure that now they're you know they're more than uh, you know twenty billion dollars uh, in the hole, and this is this is uh, accelerating. But when you when you zoom out long term, actually Jim Bianco had really good charts on this where he he kind of uh, went back and made the whole model uh, accumulative. Basically, over the past decade, the, the Federal Reserve has sent the Treasury about a trillion dollars, almost exactly. And so now they're quickly reversing that. Uh, but of course, they're they're reversing it from that, you know, that long accumulation of, of money sent to the, the Treasury. And there's a kind of a couple key takeaways here. One is that much like Social Security, this is now a uh, it's basically a, a surplus that has gone away. Right. So this is another revenue source that the federal government has has lost now. Uh, for the foreseeable future. And number two, when we see that the Federal Reserve is losing money, essentially, uh, we have to ask ourselves who's on the other side of that, who's actually gaining money, right? Because that can obviously give us some potential interest for where we might want to invest. And the short answer is that, you know, that money is going to reverse repos, right? So for example, money market funds, you know, managed by Fidelity, for example, they're making use of that. Uh, And then it's also going to bank reserves. Banks are getting paid uh, well over 4% just to have their cash balance at the Fed. And that's interesting because if you look at a normal bank account, you know, they're they're paying less than 1% on average for their their liability side to their depositors of different types. Obviously some type of, of accounts pay higher than others. Many times checking accounts are very very low interest. And so they're essentially borrowing from you for near zero. And then they can deposit at the Fed for over four percent, so they're actually earning a, a much higher interest spread than they did, uh, you know, just a year ago. And so that's that's kind of what I'm emphasizing with this chart that it both plays into the the prior discussed problems of of the U.S.'s overall deficit situation and points us to potential investment opportunities in the commercial banking sector. Lynn, moving on to page six, it comes as no surprise that we've seen a, a tripling, really, of banks' holdings of cash and treasuries. If you're holding treasuries and uh, and you're the bank and that means that you get to make this huge spread on your customer deposits, of course you're going to be holding a lot of treasuries. Is that the only thing that's been driving this huge increase and how come it seems to have come off since the end of 2021? Well, so what this chart shows is the the percentage of bank's assets that consist of cash and treasuries. And so it's not the raw dollar amount, it's the percentage of their total assets. And so essentially the the lower this figure is, um, and it reached its low back in, in around 2008. That basically means that the majority of their asset book is in riskier assets, things that can actually lose nominal value, things that, that have credit risk that can get defaulted on. Right. So that can include bank loans, uh, obviously, is a big component, all sorts of mortgages, things like that. It can also include riskier securities. Whereas the higher percentage that this is, the more of their total assets are in nominally risk free assets like you know bank reserves at, at the Fed. Uh, and treasury and agency securities. And what's interesting is that that low that it reached in 2008 uh, and you know really the, the lead up to that, that was only matched by 1929. 
right? So the right right prior to the Great Depression, basically both both the end of the 1920s and the end of the the 2000s coincided with banks taking on a significant amount of lending risk. Um, basically, that you know there was it was the greatest percentage that they've ever been exposed to assets that can lose value. And of course, that's protected by their by their you know their capital buffers. But a capital buffer only goes so far if if your overall loan book is quite aggressively positioned because it only takes a small percentage of of losses to blow through your capital buffer. And so going into that at that period, banks were very 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 vulnerable. But due to increased bank regulations, due to uh, you know self regulation by the industry, basically not to repeat the same mistakes they made before, due to quantitative easing, due to the troubled asset release program, banks were recapitalized, uh, very similar to how they were in the 1930s. And so uh, in recent years, banks have among the highest allocations they've they've ever had, you know, at least going back to, you know, the you have to go back to like the, the 50s to find a similar period where they were this invested uh, as a percentage of their assets into cash and treasuries. And so overall, banks basically still have a very conservative loan book, and they, they have a very high allocation to these safe assets. And as we discussed on the on the prior slide, they're getting paid pretty high interest rates uh, on those assets, especially their, their bank reserves that are basically, you know, they're not taking duration risk. They're just getting paid out a, a very good spread compared to what they're getting on deposits. And so the point I make with this slide is that a lot of people are, are, in my view, fighting the last war. They're always worried about banking crises. They're always worried about like a repeat of 2008. And while I do think that there are a lot of economic problems, I do think we face recession risk uh, later this year. I don't see the problem emanating from the banking sector. Basically, the banking sector would be hit just like any other sector in a recession. But historically, most recessions are not financial crises. Uh, they don't emanate from the banking sector like they did in 2008. And so my overall contention is that you know, the banks are actually pretty strong in the United States uh, and that, that they do present some potential investment opportunities and that this whole story contributes to why uh, inflation is likely to be persistent once we get past kind of a you know a, a a brief cyclical disinflationary period. Lynn, on page seven and eight, you've got two different examples: one of a bank, one of a uh, pipeline limited partnership. What are these slides about? What are they telling us? And what's the comparison between the two of them? So these are some example investments that I use uh, both for their own sake and to kind of show an example of what's happening in these industries. And so a lot of people, when you when you when you hear about stocks, you know, people say are stocks expensive or are they cheap? What is the you know the average price to earnings ratio of the S and P 500? But of course, that's a that's a very diverse collection of different uh, industries, different different companies. And the example here is to show that uh, you know, especially in the value space, uh, you know, value really underperformed over the past decade. And it's had a rebound uh, ever since the bottom in 2020. And my overall view is that you know there will be pullbacks along the way, but that value still really is, is probably the place to be going forward for at least the next several years. Historically, value equities tend to outperform growth equities in more inflationary environments, whereas growth equities tend to outperform value equities when you have the whole commodity situation under control. Uh, that allows valuations to to go very high. That allows growth to be kind of you know really priced well into the future. Whereas when you have more inflationary environments, when you have more resource constraints, uh, when you have just just overall more inflation, that's when value tends to do well. And so uh, on slide seven here, I start with a bank example. So this is the seventh largest bank in the United States, Truist Financial. Nothing particularly special about this bank. It's just an example that I'm choosing that I've done you know some research on. And essentially what I'm showing is that, you know, right now the bank stock has taken quite a hit throughout the past year. It's gone down quite significantly, almost as much in dollar terms as it did during the 2020 COVID crash. And yet analysts are pretty bullish. So the black line here is the share price. The the blue uh, line essentially represents what the share price would be at its historically average valuation if analysts are correct about the next two years of earnings. And I actually think that they're they're a little bit too bullish. Uh, I, I don't think they're factoring in some of the economic pain that is likely ahead. But I also think that the that the market is perhaps a little bit too bearish. I, I think that the share price here is too low relative to the forward prospects of banks. Uh, I think essentially the market is kind of pricing in you know, a, a decent chance of like a 2008 type of event, kind of a, a bank-centered crisis, whereas 
uh, basically, I view banks, including this one, but also many others of kind of the mid mid-sized banks and even some of the large banks, to actually be pretty attractive investment opportunities. They're they're historically undervalued, and as we discussed in the prior two slides, they're more conservatively positioned than they have been in in generations uh, in aggregate. And due to the Fed's uh, attempt to get interest rates under control, they're earning a pretty attractive free spread. Uh, on that, you know, less risky portion of their asset book, and so I think that that you know banks are actually a pretty interesting place when you look over, say, a five-year period. Now there are, you know, some realistic concerns around 2023, but I think a lot of that's already priced in, and I think this is this is a place to watch over a five-year period. Um, the the final slide, slide eight, shows kind of a similar phenomenon that I'm seeing a lot in in pipeline companies. So a lot of people, when they think about energy, they think of uh, either the commodities themselves or they think of the producers. Whereas another way to play the space is through uh, the infrastructure around transporting them. And you know, pipelines are natural monopolies once they're built, essentially. They have a lot of protection. They have long-term cash flow potential. Uh, they have a lot of fixed debt uh, on a uh, you know kind of a real asset base. And pipelines got a bad rap over the past decade because uh, in in 2014, they reached very, very high valuation levels. They were over levered in many cases. They were reliant on continually issuing more equity and debt to finance themselves. And that all, of course, uh, came undone when there was a very large uh, oil bear market. And so investor appetite for their debt and equity issuance dried up. Many of them uh, had to cut their dividends. This this example, Enterprise Products Partners, did not. They were, you know, they were basically a lot more conservative than a lot of their peers. But a lot of them had to cut their their dividends. But now, and of course, they, you know, in 2020 they blew up again. Uh, some of the ones that made it through the the prior thing then blew up in 2020. But a lot of that has been washed out now. And a lot of the industry is self financing, which means that instead of relying on constantly issuing debt and equity to finance themselves. Many of them are paying for their growth, paying for their capex through their own cash flows, and then they're either holding their share count average, or in many cases, they're actually performing buybacks uh, like you'd see in other industries. And so these are these are pretty high yielding, pretty inexpensive assets that make money from transporting energy and refined products and petrochemicals. And I view this as probably a, a place of five year outperformance because I think that. The environment that we're in now, with with more persistent supply constraints, uh, you know, a more persistent inflation. Once we get past this current disinflationary cycle, that can keep a lid on the S and P 500. I wouldn't be surprised if the S and P 500 chops along sideways for five years in a pretty volatile band. And so, when you can look at things that are actually pretty cheap and that actually pay a pretty high yield, when you look at total returns over, say, a five year period. I think those can potentially outperform, especially on a risk-adjusted basis, the S&P 500. Lynn, let's zoom back out to the 100,000-foot level. A lot of people had forecast a major recession in 2023. And uh, some people say it's already begun. Some people say we got, we're off the hook. It's not coming. Uh, where do we stand? Are we still looking at a big recession coming? I think we're looking at a high likelihood of at least a mild recession. Um, I think how severe or how long it is will partly depend on policymakers because this is a very levered, uh, very kind of centrally managed economic environment. So it, unfortunately, a lot of that comes down to human decisions and how humans respond to the environment. But essentially, if you look at most economic indicators, uh, they show that that you know, the economy has been decelerating from its peak in 2021. So purchasing managers indices are rolling over. Uh, Conference board leading indicators are rolling over. You know, copper to gold ratio rolled over. Yield curve inverted. That's a big one, obviously. That, that's, that's accurately predicted the past eight recessions with no no false signals if you're looking at the 10-year the minus three-month curve. All of that points to uh, either severe economic slowdown or, or uh, you know, kind of a near recession or potentially cause, you know, resulting in an outright recession. The area that's been resilient is the labor market, but the labor market has always been a, a lagging or a coincident indicator. And even there, we're starting to see around the margins, some of the leading components of the labor market are looking weak. So for example, overtime hours are decelerating. Uh, temporary hires, uh, which generally are more volatile and leading compared to the broader non-farm payroll 
measures. Uh, those temporary hires have also are, are down on a year-over-year basis slightly. And so the early warning signs are, are pointing towards weakness, even in that part of the market that, that's been pretty strong. And so I, I, I think that we we absolutely have to, uh, you know, kind of a, have a baseline that there's a, a you know, a, a high probability of a, a, at least a mild recession. Uh, I think where I might differ from the market is that, um, you know, I don't view it as a financial crisis per se. I don't view it as, you know, I think that banks will have elevated loan losses. They're going to put money aside to, to pay for those loan losses. Uh, you know, energy, energy might be volatile this year, but I don't think it's going to be one of those like big, long, persistent, disinflationary, you know, financial crises like a lot of people come to uh, expect. Basically, once we went through 2008, uh, then we also went through this big crash in 2020, where you know basically that uh, once again killed oil prices. That once again resulted in, in spectacular losses, at least temporarily. Uh, I think this is more of a grindy type of recession, kind of a a post dot com bubble type of recession, but with more inflationary characteristics. And so I I, I think that investors have to be careful about assuming their playbook. I think a reasonable comparison would be that, you know, if you ask people in the beginning of 2022, so about a year ago, if you said that the PMI, the, the purchasing managers index is going to roll over sharply, should you buy or sell bonds? Most people would say, I'd, I'd want to buy bonds. Uh, and, and historically, those have been pretty correlated. Generally, you want to buy bonds when the, when the PMI is rolling over and you want to sell bonds and you want to buy more risky assets when PMI is rolling back up. But of course, this was a decoupling. This was the PMI rolled over, but because you had supply side inflation, you had bonds do terribly. You had the worst year uh, basically in, in modern history, despite the fact that it was a period of economic decelerating, bad stock market, uh, downward PMIs. And so I think we could have one of those weird environments where we do encounter a recession, but it doesn't necessarily impact some of the areas that we've come to expect that it that it normally hits. Like some of these more cyclical value-oriented sectors, I think could hold up better than people think. And then once you get past that period and you go to the next growth cycle, let's say 2024, 2025, uh, I think those are going to be pretty attractive areas to to keep on your radar. Where does that leave us with respect to the stock market? Because uh, a lot of people have said that the bear market is over. It's, uh, you know, it, it bottomed wherever it was, 35 something on the S&P. And that was it. Other people have said, no, 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 this is just the warm up. We're only halfway through this bear market. Uh, how do you see this? Is the final low in? So I, I doubt it, but I'm, I'm thinking less in terms of what is the low going to be and more along the lines of what is the probable range of future returns over a three or five year period. And I don't view those as very positive. Uh, basically, my base case is kind of a, a long multi-year period of, of sideways type of action, especially in inflation adjusted terms. So I think we could reach lower lows. Uh, I think it'll be trouble. It'd be hard for the market to reach all time highs and keep going from there. Um, I think we're going to be in kind of this ricocheting uh, bounded period for quite a while. And that's a problem when, you know, the S&P 500 dividend yield is is historically still quite low. And so basically, if you're not getting a lot of capital appreciation, you're not really going anywhere. And that's why I think actually some of these these dividend paying type of equities, uh, especially ones that are, you know, have have pretty good prospects, good, good strong balance sheets um, that are still growing. I think basically they can they can compensate you in that sort of flat and choppy environment. So you know they also their actual share prices might be might be flat, might be choppy, might be mildly up. But if they're paying you four, five, six, seven, eight percent per year during that five year period, I think the total return could be more interesting. So I, I'm I'm not very bullish on S and P 500 over a five year view. Uh, and I do I do think we're going to get probably lower lows, but that's that's a lower conviction part of my case. In the past two years, especially, the market's very much been trading on liquidity. And so the Federal Reserve is still withdrawing liquidity. That's been partially offset recently by the fact that the, the, the Treasury's general account has not drawn up to the level that they said it would. Uh, so the, the Treasury general account's also been drawing down. And that's actually that's positive for liquidity. And with the looming debt ceiling, uh, historically, that, that's, that's caused the TGA to draw down almost to zero. So it actually, it's a temporary net injection of liquidity into the market. Uh, and so at least for the moment, the Fed, the Fed's liquidity would drain is being offset by the Treasury. But if you look at the second half of this year, like let's say the debt ceiling gets resolved, uh, and let's say the Fed is still doing quantitative tightening, if the Treasury tries to refill the Treasury general account from that low base, uh, that would suck a lot of liquidity out of the market. 
which is what the Fed's doing as well. And that's that's an environment where I could see a lower low, especially if that coincides with a recession uh, and coincides with some sort of shock that causes the Fed to to pause or to you know resume some sort of accommodative action. So I, I don't think the market's out of the woods yet. I don't think the S&P 500 is a very attractive place to be, but I do think that there are kind of surprising pockets of value uh, in certain sectors like the ones I've covered here. Let's move to the commodity side of the house, which I know you follow as I do. There's been a disturbance in the force, Lynn, uh, around the changing from 22 to 23. And it seems like what everybody's doing is selling eggs and buying metals. What do you think is driving that? Is it related to China reopening? I, I think a lot of it is uh, likely about the China's reopening. Basically, you, you know that that's accelerated faster than some people thought. Uh, basically, in 2022, it, if anything, it happened slower than people thought. But now, it seems to be happening quite quickly. And I did analysis on uh, Taiwan's change of zero COVID policy in 2022, which was essentially that they take they they maintained very tight you know ways of controlling the virus, not necessarily in the country, but you know uh, in and out of the country. Uh, basically, their their tourist arrivals, for example, were near zero, uh, and their and their case uh, levels were very low. But when they when Omicron came out and they realized that it's just it's it's not tenable to con- to constrain that anymore, they basically ripped the bandaid off and said, okay, we're not doing zero COVID. We're gonna we're gonna start uh, treating this like a like a, a seasonal problem, uh, and just kind of live through it. And what you had was a, a burst of the virus going through a population that was that was still pretty unexposed. You unfortunately had a spike of deaths, and and obviously that caused kind of a, a near term disturbance. But then it, it it normalizes over time. And so China is essentially you know in December uh, and recently they kind of went through the same exact thing, just on a delayed basis. Basically they they ripped the bandaid off. Um, there's reports of, of of quite a significant spike in deaths, but that's it's kind of part of the inevitable process of of the country normalizing. And so as that completes, I do think we're going to see more overall Chinese tourism out of the country. So that should be favorable for oil prices uh, generally. I also think that uh, you could see a little bit of an uptick in construction, uh, which should be good for copper. I'm more focused currently on energy markets. Uh, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical of copper this year just due to recession risks, whereas I, I, I think energy is probably uh, better positioned overall. But much like energy, uh, I'm very bullish on copper with a with a five or 10 year view. I think this would be a very good decade for copper, even if it's uh, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of it for, say, a, a six or 12 month period. Let's stay on the topic of metals, Lynn, but move on to uranium, which I know you follow, as I've been following more and more closely lately. We've seen a pretty sudden spike up in uranium prices and uranium miners. What's behind it? Well, so timing like that, uh, you know, basically it's been grinding higher and putting in a good, pretty good base. It obviously had a spike shortly after uh, the Russian invasion. Then uranium prices settled down. Uh, and I think that the market has essentially kind of found a base and is exploring like a, a, another move higher. You know, you've, you've covered well in your program kind of the long-term story here of uranium, that basically if we want to keep the lights on over the next several years, uh, we're going to have to have just overall kind of higher uranium prices um, and, and more development and refinement uh, of uranium. Um, I also think that as we encounter more and more energy crises, uh, like what we've seen in Europe, uh, I think uranium is going to continually be revisited. Uh, certainly, the the um, you know emerging market countries are are not shy about building more nuclear plants, and you know I think we could start to see the developed world eventually kind of reassess uh, and and already around the margins has been reassessing its negative view of uranium. I started covering uranium back in uh, I believe it was October 2020, and that was before Sprott acquired the Uranium Participation Corp. So back then. It was a very out of favor trade. The fund was trading at like a 20% discount to NAV. So you could buy uranium at like 80 cents on the dollar. And, you know, we've obviously seen, we've come a long way since then over the past two and a half years. So the price of uranium is higher. You know, the price of the fund uh, is higher. Uh, it's under different management. But a lot of the long term thesis is still there that basically there's still not been uh, a resolution to these long term supply and demand dynamics that we can see in front of us. So, you know, if you look back historically, most commodity bull markets tend to occur in unison, right? At least when you when you zoom out to like, you know, is it a good or a bad decade for commodities? You know, there's always exceptions around the margins, but normally 
because they're kind of influenced by the same types of macro forces that result in periods of under underinvestment, undersupply, and then overinvestment, oversupply. So I expect that you know th- this decade overall to be good for the majority of commodities, and that includes practically all energy commodities, uh, including uh, I do think uranium is very interesting on a, on a risk reward basis, and you know just just holding the underlying commodity directly. Uh, with Sprott, for example, uh, is a is an attractive kind of risk reward way to hold it because you don't have to worry about bankruptcy risk of miners. You don't have to worry about you know what if you what if what if the price stays flat for a few years and and kind of uh, erodes their capital. Um, I think basically this this serves as a as a pretty good diversifier in a portfolio. Well, Lynn, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, please tell us a little bit more about what you do at Lynn Alden Investment Strategy and what our listeners can expect to find when they visit LynnAlden.com. Sure. So I, I put out a variety of public uh, articles and newsletters. So uh, I put out, for example, a public newsletter every six weeks. People can check that out. And then I also have a low-cost research service that's aimed at both uh, institutional and retail investors that, that cover. It comes out every two weeks, and it covers what's happening in macro, as well as uh, covering specific investment opportunities, whether it's sectors or specific equities. Because uh, what, I, what I generally try to do is that um, – I find that going down to the micro helps circle back and, and reinforce what's happening in the macro. Uh, and so I try to, to, to blend those to some extent. Well, Lynn, we look forward to getting you back on in a few months for another update. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Lynn back on the show. Now, joining us in the post game is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's just jump straight into the charts. Listeners, you'll find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Lynn's picture saying, Looking for the downloads. So, Nick, Let's get to some of these charts. On uh, page two, we have the S&P 500. Uh, I know you're always on those options markets. What levels are you watching? Yeah, so today I'm looking at the spot on SPX 39.10. Looking at the February 17th OPEX right now for the expected move. The expected move right now is 200 points in other direction, which denotes about a 5.1% move in other direction. So the upper expected move is 41.10. Keep in mind, strong resistance at 4,000, which we've tested recently. And then the next pivot is 41.20, which is also strong resistance right there as well. Um, The lower expected move is 37.10, where support right now is at around 3,800 and then 3,700, with the lows at 3,500 acting as very heavy support back from last October. Now, next week we have flash PMI on U.S. manufacturing and services on Tuesday, and then we have jobless claims on Thursday and consumer sentiment on Friday. So there's a lot of reason to believe we're going to see some volatility into the next month or so. Now, Eric, what are your thoughts here on the S&P? We've had several guests caution us that a lot of bear market rallies tend to end right around the 200-day moving average. This is now the third time in the last few months that we've seen a move that stayed above the 200-day moving average for two or three daily closes and then moved back below. So it looks to me like we've seen another failure at the 200-day moving average. Is the third time the charm? Are we headed much lower from here? I guess time will tell. The next uh, indication along the way will be the 100-day moving average, which right now is 3878 on the March futures contract. Yeah, Eric, I put that 200-day moving average on that chart, and uh, you're just showing how uh, the testing of that zone has uh, rejected the market numerous times. While the 3,800 support that, uh, Nick, you're talking about uh, is uh, lines up very well with the uh, early part of January's lows, the level that I'm actually watching is closer to this 3,900 where we're trading right now, because if the bulls are going to still keep control of this market, Uh, I look at it that they need to keep it above this 3,900 level. These two-day little pullbacks should immediately be bought on dip if the market is heading higher. I think uh, it really starts to show technical deterioration if we're already heading to 3,800. And while certainly little uh, support lines along there could hold, you know, with the vulnerability of the market where we are, 
uh, once we're down to 3,800, I, uh, I think some of those lower boundary targets that you have down toward 3,500 have to be seriously considered um, under those conditions. Uh, what else are you watching on that? Well, um, I was looking at some hedges on uh, S&P right now for myself going forward a month, just you know, factoring in that we have earnings coming up as well. And so I always think to myself, you know, uh, how much insurance do I want to pay for my portfolio right now? And one of the best ways that I find to hedge myself is using butterfly put spreads. So again, this is a purely a hedge idea that, that I'm thinking about using myself. I haven't put it on yet. So the price will obviously change at open today uh, as we adjust prices at open. But the whole idea here is that you're looking at the February OPEX, which is February 17th. And we're looking at a 3,800, 3,600, 3,400 butterfly put spread on SPX. That would mean you know, buying one contract, the $3,800 puts, uh, selling two contracts at 3,600, and then buying one contract at 3,400. Um, in essence here, the risk really is uh, $25 per contract, roughly. Notional value would be 2,500 uh, per contract. And the upside here on the, on the hedge would be 200 points wide, so $20,000 less the premium paid. So 17 and a half grand roughly of upside on two and a half thousand risk. But again, this only would transpire at expiration. So if the move to the middle yeah. strike happened prematurely, you would not see the maximum profit. The reason why I use this kind of strategy is because it, re it requires much less capital, whereas buying a put on its own, for example, might cost five or $6,000 for one position, which is a lot to spend on you know, single hedge uh, per position, I prefer to spend less money and have a better asymmetry of risk overall. What are your thoughts on this, Patrick? Yeah, I I like the strategy. I mean, the the key here is is that you're you're not really hedging uh, the entire left tail of a market drop. You're basically looking for a, uh, a scenario where, well, look, if the market's going to head back and retest those lows from uh, you know the third uh, and fourth quarter of last year, uh, that you want to be able to have some sort of a payoff that allows you to uh, uh, be making money when the rest of your portfolio is dragging, and so. If you're looking for just a, a modest pullback in the market over the next month back to the lows, this is certainly a, a very interesting way of putting it on. And I always like that when you can put on a hedge with a, a relatively low cost. And, you know, we've talked in previous episodes that you can even try offset that with some call credit spreads above to try to help finance those costs. But uh, let's move on, though, and look at the NASDAQ. We have the QQQs on page four. I just wanted to start off with with my Kind of perspective, the entire rally on the queues more or less stalled out uh, right along its fib retracement zones. It's basically just a mean reverting bounce off of what was a, a sequence of uh, support line lows that were put in in October and November and again in January. Uh, if this is all the bulls can muster for the, the NASDAQ, um, it doesn't bode well for the markets. I mean, uh, when you see what's happening in global equity and you're see what's happening in, in so many of the kind of more defensive sectors. The fact that the NASDAQ has been dogging it this badly, it just continues to show its relative weakness. Uh, what levels are you watching on the queues? Yeah, so the spot right now as I speak is around um, 275 on queues. Uh, expected move again for the February 17th monthly OPEX is about 16 points in other direction, which denotes about a 5.8% move. Upper expected move here is 291 with resistance right now at 290 or so, and there's a gap way above at 310 or so. Um, lower expected move is 259, with support at 260 and heavy support at the lows, uh, October lows of 254 or so. Um, now in the past year, we've had numerous rallies that sold off heavily by anywhere from nine to 14%. So a 10% decline from here takes us to new lows below 250 to around 247 or so. And keep in mind that tonight we have Netflix reporting earnings Next week, we have Microsoft reporting on Tuesday, the 24th, uh, after market close. And then the following week, we have Meta reporting, Apple reporting, and Google reporting. So the heavy hitters in tech. And if, if you know, these layoffs are any, any indication on how they're performing right now, we may see you know, some underperformance on earnings, which could see the tech sector drag lower. Uh, although it's possible that with layoffs being accrued over the last few months, like for example at Meta, they may see lower capital expenditures, which may boost EPS perhaps. But again, that's just a small little thought I had right there. Um, overall, I'm pretty bearish on the tech sector right now. 
Right. And so what, one of the things, uh, you know, we were just talking about hedging out with the uh, S&P 500. Uh, if one was uh, uh, in the queues and wanting to hedge that out, uh, you also put up here on page uh, five a, a, a put butterfly spread. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So similar idea to the SPX one we just discussed. So you have a 270, 250, 230 put butterfly spread for the February 17th monthly OPEX. The reason why I chose that expiration date is because it encapsulates all the tech earnings, right? And the reason why I chose the strike prices, obviously, are because if we hit that middle strike of the 250 area, that would denote new lows. And so that would be the target area where you'd you know, want this to end up if you were hedging with this strategy. But again, it, it is a hedge. The risk here is uh, 250 or so per contract um, with upside of, again, 1750 or so per contract. So risking $250 upside of 1750 per position but again this this is at expiration right if this move happens well in advance of expiration for example next week you won't see the maximum profit because the butterfly put spread doesn't work that way what, what would you add here patrick in terms of um, like ideation on this strategy well, I mean, I, I don't really think uh, there's much to add. I mean, ultimately, it's a bigger question for me as to whether uh, hedge is necessary in this market environment. And, uh, you know, while we have numerous guests come on with uh, far more kind of neutral views, I, I look at it that we just need uh, to know that uh, some of that left tail risk is being hedged when you're uh, staying invested in these kind of uh, um, tight market conditions. Nonetheless, though, on page six, uh, I wanted to really talk about this VIX. Uh, what was really interesting here, Nick, was uh, we had um, uh, last week a break to uh, lower lows, well, at least uh, from uh, some of the uh, lows put in through the second half of last year. We had the VIX temporarily breaking below the 20 level. It uh, had a quick trip down to 18. Now we're seeing little spikes back above 20 here, but uh, really low vol conditions. And to me, it made a whole bunch of sense for it to be that way in December because you know when you have the low volume holiday period odds are markets could be trade range bound so you got it some of that volatility uh, narrows and that gets reflected in the VIX but here we are in the middle of January going into the FOMC uh, the ECB is going to be talking all the earnings are coming out there's all this uh, points that could trigger volatility in the month forward and volatility still relatively uh, low or at least on the cheaper end of where we have seen in the last year. What's your take on it? Yeah, well, as I said, said in the past, looking at the vol for the past or the, the VIX for the past year or so, we've only stayed at this low range for very short periods of time, you know, a week or two weeks here and there, uh, followed by an abrupt movement toward 35 or so on the highs. And so uh, the way that I'm reading it is that we have the January OPEX coming up tomorrow which is a very, very major OPEX. I think there's a few trillion dollars of roll-off uh, for option contracts tomorrow. So with hedges in place for tomorrow's OPEX, um, I expect muted volatility into that event. But then thereafter, I expect much more volatility to pick up as new hedges are put on you know, by buying out-of-the-money calls and puts, which will exacerbate the VIX's movements. So right here, the, the bounce off that 18 or so area from yesterday up to 21.62 you know, right now, which is the spot roughly, um, I, I see us moving perhaps to 25 or so, especially if we get negative earnings uh, in big tech, and that could precipitate a push toward you know 35, which would also coincide with a, the pullback in the broad markets of around 10 percent, perhaps. Right? If you look at the you know the put to call volume on the VIX is you know 0.13, so about 10 times the number of calls being opened per put, which is very very bullish on the VIX and very very bearish on broad markets. And then the put to call interest is 0.25, so you have roughly four times the number of calls being opened per put. Um, so very, very bullish fix and very, very bearish in broad markets as well, right? So um, I do think that we're going to see some volatility after tomorrow. But moving on to page seven, Eric, what are your thoughts here on gold? After last week's show, we saw a nice exuberant $25 breakout above trendline resistance. And then we came down exactly as you would expect to retest that resistance line as a support line. Getting back down to 1898, I bought 1900 even uh, on that retest, but I only bought in a very small amount because although I do want to add to my position, I kind of have a feeling that we might be seeing the beginning of a more substantial correction here. 
As I'm speaking right now, before the Open on Thursday morning, I'm looking at 1908 on the February gold delivery contract. So still holding above the trend line and right about on the five-day moving average. Is that trend line right around 1900 going to hold, or are we maybe going to get a more sizable correction? I wouldn't be surprised if we got down to somewhere between say 1860 and 1880 as arranged for where a a more substantial correction might take us. One way or another, I still think the trend is going to continue to the upside. All that remains to be seen is how deep this little correction that we're having is going to be. Eric, I completely agree. You know, there's a lot of people out there that have a very strong bullish tilt on the short term. And I'm far more long term bullish gold. But I I still think at the at this stage in the market cycle, we're still a little too early for uh, gold to be making this rip to all time new highs, at least too early uh, in the first part of the year. If conditions uh, are right in the latter part of the year, certainly I'd uh, like to be optimistic that gold can make um, that really big push. But for me, just the way you want to keep some dry powder for a correction, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think the short-term upside is, while certainly we could see quick little surge towards 2000, and uh, but I think uh, pullbacks toward 1800 are where my focal points are going to be. I think if we have these kind of hundred hundred and fifty dollar pullbacks over a multi week period would uh create the window from which there would be compelling buy on dips. What I wanted though move on here to page eight where I have crude oil. And it was interesting because uh, we had at the start of that year that drop in crude that uh, that you were highlighting uh, all along, and and we recovered off of those lows very quickly. And that to me is starting to demonstrate that crude oil is much more uh, going to be trade range bound. Uh, now I think there's a lot of technical repair work that crude oil would have to do in order for a new bull trend to be confirmed. Uh, but at minimum, I think that. Uh, switching to this uh, you know trading support resistance on crude oil it should increasingly work and so any uh, short term dips uh, in crude could be bought to uh, trade to the top end of the ranges and that's uh, certainly something that uh, we're going to uh, keep a close eye on when I'm trading moving on on page 9 I just wanted to quickly touch on copper because I know Lynn touched on her uh, views on copper this level right around this 425 to 430 was uh, my target zones for copper on this advance. Uh, And uh, obviously the China reopening story is a great tailwind. I uh, continue to be long-term bullish copper, but I think that my view on copper is very similar to gold, which is, well, it's been a great move. It's certainly advanced to some upper ranges uh, that uh, certainly give a, a, a pretty clear bullish tilt. But I still think that these are vulnerable here in the first half of the year to uh, retesting on the downside. And I wanted to just wrap with uh, one final chart here on the 10-year treasury yield. And I wanted to just uh, highlight that we have finally now seen yields uh, really back off uh, to now levels where it'll be really interesting to see whether or not this kind of bullish yields, bearish bonds trend continues. Uh, The way I kind of look at it is is that uh, bonds have now reverted from a very oversold level. Yields have really backed off. And this is going to be a real big tell as to whether or not there's a much more meaningful bond bottom and uh, and in going into 2023. So it's certainly going to be something key that I'm going to be watching. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. Well, in this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview with Lynn, as well as a link to the slide deck she provided, as uh, well as the chart book we just discussed here in the postgame. There's also a link to a number of articles that we found interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets, and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup 
at macrovoices.com and you will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That is Eric spelled with a K and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna and myself, thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.